Mr. Teru. Today we're going to be looking at scatter plots in statistics. Now, a scatter plot will be the first graph that we take a look at that displays two quantitative pieces of data, or it's a bivariate graph. Uh, instead of maybe you're doing quality control at the end of an assembly line and you're looking for how many grams of something is in an item, where you're just looking at that one variable. That's, for stem, that's when you look at stem plots, box plots, and histograms, when you're just looking at one variable. Well, now we're going to look at two. And the example you're going to see here in a minute, uh, since this is about school, is uh, we're going to look at hours uh, of studying per week and GPA. And we're going to compare those two variables. I'm just going to make the numbers up. But again, the idea of the structure of a scatter plot. So a scatter plot and correlation, uh, I thought I was going to fit more notes up here. We won't really speak more, much about correlation in this video, but I'll mention it. Again, we're dealing with two quantitative variables. Uh, we are looking for any observable pattern that shows there is a relationship between two variables. Now, whether that really means the variable on the x-axis is causing the change on the y, uh, that'd be nice if we could show it, but that's not always necessary. We just want to use scatter plots to make predictions, use those x values to predict values of y. And there doesn't necessarily have to be, and most of the time there will not be, a cause and effect relationship. We can only run statistical analysis on linear patterns. So when we draw a scatter plot with our calculator by hand, if it doesn't follow a linear pattern, we can talk about what we see and whether it's positive association or negative association, or maybe the points are scattered all over the place, or horizontal line, where there's no association. But if it's linear, and this is only intro to statistics, so we're limited to uh, only being able to run math calculations on a linear pattern, again, just because it's intro to statistics. Uh, if you have a clear explanatory and response variable, explanatory will go on the x-axis, and the response will go on the y. Alrighty then, so you got that copy? Uh, and this is just a structure, like a sort of an outline of topics that are in this section. You definitely are going to have some more notes, and you'll definitely want to look at those examples in your book to get a clear idea of exactly what you'll be doing. When there is no clear explanatory response variable, then it doesn't really matter what you put on the x or y axis, just put whatever you want where you want it. But again, if you think there might even be a chance that one variable is helping to explain why the other one is happening or why the uh, y values is changing, put the explanatory on the x-axis. Patterns. Um, again, we, we're going to be hoping to see a pattern uh, in our scatter plots so that we can use our x's to predict our y values. Uh, okay. Great. <laughs> we will not be using the language of independent and dependent because we're trying to emphasize how hard it is to prove cause and effect. Um, we are all pretty convinced now that smoking does cause lung cancer, but for a long time it was just, you know, there's a lot of evidence of that because people that smoke might uh, drink more, have a different, uh, you know, lifestyle like what they do for work or how much they make a year, uh, you know, for healthcare and such. So cause and effect is a very, very hard thing to prove. So we want to avoid any kind of language that falsely implies that X is causing the change in Y unless we can actually prove that. And that is difficult and will not really be discussed in this video. A pattern in the scatter plot shows that there is just some relationship, which could just be by coincidence, but if there's a relationship, if there's a pattern, whether it's straight, whether it's curved, like maybe it looks like exponential growth, if there's a pattern in the scatter plot, then we can use the values of X to predict the values of Y. So even though it could be just coincidence, it is still going to be useful. And again, I'm going to say this word correlation, but I did not fit it on the board, and I don't think I'm going to fit it in 15 minutes. Exactly what correlation is, we will be talking about that in a later video. But correlation does not mean causation. Just because you see a pattern in a scatter plot, even if it's perfectly straight, you will not be able to say that the X is causing the change in Y. Now, it's like running track day, yeah, I've got to change this camera. So, no, 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 Alrighty then. Now, here, I'm going to just make up a couple of quick examples of a scatter plot and show some relationship. Now, we would hope that, that how much you study will improve your GPA. 
And as a reminder, quantitative data only on the x or y axis. You can make something that looks like a scatter plot with maybe a categorical variable on the x axis, but by definition it is not. Only x and y variables uh, can be quantitative, no categorical. So let's just say that we assume that the more you study, the higher GPA will be. Well, clearly, there's a limit to how high your GPA can get. And if you have a 3.9, you've got to study a lot to get a 4.0. So I'm going to guess that that pattern would not be actually linear. Maybe it kind of sort of tapers down as you increase the hours of studying. And then a couple times, and we always have those kids, like I've got a couple like now, that uh, hardly study at all, but yet their, their grades are just phenomenal. And you will have some students that will study a lot and not really have very much or uh, very good GPA. So, you know, the pattern might not be very tight, but there could be and probably will be sort of an overall upward trend of those values. Okay, and I think it's pretty reasonable to think that the hours you study is going to affect your GPA. Well, okay, let's just super briefly, I'll do a calculator video to help show you how to do this in your calculator, but Let's say that all these blue dots represent females. Okay, what if I do want to display um, some categorical variables in my scatter plot? What if I want to compare the work with the guy uh, with the women to the men? How can I put that categorical variable into the scatter plot? Well, with your calculator, the hours and the GPA are probably going to be in list one and list two. And since I just did an example of women's uh, work ethic and GPA, maybe I'll want to put the men in as an orange dot. Well, in a calculator, if you're not doing this by hand, what you'll do is in list three, put some more hours in. And in list four, put some GPAs in and actually make uh, two scatter plots at once. Plot one for the women, plot two for the men, and display those on the same screen, and then with a different marker or a different color, uh, maybe you can look at some kind of comparison. I'm kind of like laying these on top because I don't really think your gender is going to affect your GPA or your work ethic, um, or at least the relation between the two. Uh, but you can display those different marks or colors inside the scatter plot to display categorical variables in that scatter plot. But remember, the x and y axis must be quantitative. And we will do a nice calculator video to remind you or show you actually how to create these scatter plots. Now, your not studying is not the only thing that affects your GPA. Maybe, you know, it's your intelligence or maybe uh, how much pressure you get at home to do one or the other or probably both. So it kind of makes sense that what, how much you study will affect your GPA. But um, let's say that we noticed that we make a scatter plot and we compare the temperature, or excuse me, let's not do that. We're going to compare how much money is sold in ice cream to how many people come into the hospital complaining of some kind of cold. So frequency of cold. It's kind of a stupid example, right? But let's say we notice that the more ice cream is being sold, the higher this value gets um, at a certain region, maybe at a grocery store, so zero dollars to I don't know, a couple hundred dollars if you're talking about a little stand, you know, sales per day or something like that. Kind of a ridiculous example, but I just want to, you know, say that what if we did notice that in an area, the higher the ice cream sales were, the lower the frequency of cold. It's kind of like a stupid sounding example. Well, that brings us in the idea of lurking variables. When you have an X and Y variable, what X on the X axis and Y axis, there might be a direct link between those two variables, very hard to prove. Uh, now you have two types of lurking variables that could be causing that relationship to show up. There's a common response lurking variable and a confounding lurking variable. In my previous example I erased, maybe the confounding lurking variable would be not only is your hour studying affecting your GPA, 
but also just your general IQ level. Well, both of those are going to affect your GPA, the response. Now, in this kind of ridiculous example I'm talking about, between ice cream sales and whether or not people are getting colds, what could be actually causing this relationship? This might actually be valid. And in my mind, it, it kind of makes sense. What would drive up ice cream sales, and what seasons of during the year do people get fewer colds? Wouldn't that be summer? So in this example, there could very well be a common response lurking variable of just the temperature. And the temperature could be driving up the heat, could be driving up ice cream sales, and at the same time, you know, not that many people are getting sick. Well, great. I just gave you a reasonable example of a lurking variable that would follow this kind of relationship, but you know what I could still do? I could still use the ice cream sales to predict how much um, or how many people are going to a clinic or the hospital for a cold. So, scatter plots, you're making plenty of them. You'll be looking for relationships in there. Uh, they may be causation and they may not because uh, there could be a lurking variable in the background. But if there's a pattern, we can use the X's to predict the Y values. Woo! All right, one more page of notes and I got less than five minutes. All righty then. Here we go. Last page for this video. So, whoosh, bang. All right. Interpreting scatter plots. When you look at a scatter plot and you want to tell your teacher or the person grading your AP test, what do you see? Uh, make sure you hit these points. And again, this is an outline of topics and concepts, not a hard example. But you want to talk about the form. What do you see? Is the pattern linear? Is it curved? Um, or is there just some clusters of points? Um, Maybe you're comparing the SAT scores from the south to the north, and you might notice a cluster between those two regional areas in your scatter plot. Direction and strength. Does it have a positive association or a negative association? In other words, is the slope positive or is the slope negative? What's the strength? Now, students will remember strength by the end of the year as the strength or how tightly the points follow a line, you know, because it's intro to stats. And we can't talk about patterns that are not linear, at least crunch numbers on them. But the real definition of strength is how closely the points follow a clear pattern. So even if the pattern is curved, if they're perfectly in line with that curve, the strength is very, very high. We will not measure strength unless it is linear. Are there any outliers? Well, if you have a scatter plot, and I'm trying to just draw this ellipse to represent a collection of points, in this case linear points, if you, within that data range of x, have a point that's vertically above or below all the other ones, that would be marked as an outlier. An outlier is still a point that falls far outside the pattern. No outlier is good, but the ones that are horizontal, uh, horizontally lay outside the pattern, those are even more of a bad thing. They're more influential. Neither one of these outliers are necessarily good. Lines are not resistant. They use the mean in their calculation. You'll see that in formulas in the next video. But the outliers in the vertical direction do not change the slope or y-intercept as much as the outliers in the horizontal direction. So this sentence just validates or repeats what I just said. So, with interpreting a uh, scatter plot, form, direction, uh, and strength and outliers. I really should have four bullets. Form, direction, strength, and outliers. I think my 15's are all, 15 minutes are almost up. Please read your book. Read those examples. Watch my later videos when I actually finish this uh, lesson and show you how to use these with your calculator. Thank you very, very much for watching. I know there's a lot of these out there and I do appreciate you choosing my videos. Bye!